everybody. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. I'm Julie, your host, and I'm so delighted you could join us this week. My intention in doing this show is to provide information, insight, and comfort to people all over the world by helping to answer life's unanswerable questions. We got Will Leach with us this afternoon. Hi, Will. I am uh, excellent at failing to answer unanswerable questions. So I, I will do my best. Thank you for having me. I'm very delighted to be on. I'm very excited to have uh, to give inadequate answers to terrific questions, which is one of my skills. There you go. Well, I got a bunch of terrific questions for you, <laughs> hopefully. But a funny thing, everybody, I met Will a couple of months ago when he was here in Birmingham at an author's conference called Southern Voices that I've gone to for 20 years. Well, I've gone to that conference for a long time. And I listened to, I don't know, there were maybe 15 authors that were there. And if I'm gonna read fiction, I want something light and entertaining because I read nonfiction most of the time. And you gave your talk and you were charming, of course, and eloquent and all of those good things. And I was so led to have you on the show. And I thought, why? <laughs> this guy, why? Because the, the book, How Lucky Was, is about a handicapped boy that witnesses a crime. And I'm thinking, this doesn't sound entertaining at all. <laughs> However, I follow where I'm led. You are the only one I asked to be on my show out of all of those authors, you know, the most unlikely probably out of that whole <laughs> lineup. And when I read your book, I thought, okay, this is why I was led to have you on the show because number one, you are just an absolute masterful writer. Oh, oh my goodness. Heavens, thank you. That's wow. <laughs> How you combined a thriller and all this other stuff and humor and you're a big 10 guy and I'm a big 10 gal. You went to Illinois, right? Yes. Yes. And I went, and I went to the Ohio state university, of course, of course. Of course. And now we're both sec fans, you for Georgia and me for Alabama and, and, you know, a lot of humor in the book um, amongst all this other stuff and just really captivating. And the other thing that I found, Will, it was so interesting was this book is so profound in a number of ways that I want to explore with you over the next few minutes that we have together. And and that's why I wanted to have you on. I just didn't know why, but <laughs> pretty pretty early into the book, I'm like, okay, this is why I'm being led to have Will <laughs> okay. on. Well, so, okay. well, those are very, very kind things to say. I do what I, I will do what I can to uh, disappoint uh, everyone uh, with all of my answers after that such a wonderful introduction. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I have faith in you. <laughs> all right, let me tell you a little bit about Will. Will Leach is a contributing editor at New York Magazine and the founder of the late sports website, Deadspin. He's the author of six books, including How Lucky and the upcoming The Time Has Come. I see you have that displayed mm -hmm. oh, in the back. Oh, right there. Oh. Yeah, right there. <laughs> Will also writes regularly for the New York Times, Washington Post, NBC News, Medium, and, and MLB.com. Now, that's a pretty impressive lineup right there, <laughs> sir. Holy mackerel. <laughs> He lives in Athens, Georgia with his wife and his two sons. My goodness, that's those are some big old names in the writing world. You know, I, I like to make things. That's my that's my general rule. It's been my hero growing up was actually Roger Ebert, the film critic, uh, who was a beautiful writer. And he was from Urbana, Illinois, which is uh, near where I'm from in Mattoon, Illinois. And he, uh, he always said that his uh, three favorite words in the English language were by Roger Ebert. <laughs> and, and I, 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 that sounds egotistical, but what it really means is that he was kind of obsessed with the act of creation and accepts as the idea of making things. And, you know, I know some writers are kind of ponderous and they mull and they, they wait for the muse to land and visit on them. I like to make things, you know, I feel like uh, I, I to, is something remarkable to me about a blank page and I get to fill it with stuff and then it's out in the world and people can react to it. So I will confess uh, it's, a, it's a it's a healthy addiction, but I think I'm addicted to making things. Well, it doesn't he have some famous quote about, you know, the art of creation is when you're doing something or something along those I, lines. I think the, Isn't the Ebert... is, yeah, the quote is muse visits during the act of creation, not before, which yeah. is a really kind of fancy way of saying, hey, just shut up and start working. 
<laughs> and I actually always really kind of took that to, to heart. And I, I think whether it's whether I'm writing fiction or whether I'm working in journalism or or writing about sports, uh, or which or a combination of all three of those things, to, to me, I, I a writer writes, you know, and it's always felt very strange to me. Uh, you know, Ro another great Roger, Roger Ebert line because he was a newspaper writer, and I kind of came up in the online world. But I think there's a lot of similarities uh, in that he would always say, like, you can really obsess over something you wrote and really, really care about it, and it will not change the fact that tomorrow a bird is going to poop on it because someone's going to line their birdcage with it. So don't get too attached. Don't get too fancy about it. Don't sit there and be like, this must last the stand the test of time. Make something. Do the best you can at it, make it as good as you can make it, and then put it aside and make something else. And I feel like that is a is generally a pretty good strategy for writing. Yeah. Well, well, I haven't read the new book because it's not out yet. It comes out soon. But I read the How Lucky book. And uh, and it's about a boy with a disability who witnesses a crime. And I'm thinking, okay, why am I gonna read this? <laughs> and then when I got into it really early on. I'm an entrepreneur and an inventor who learned how to do woo-woo and I'm a buffet of psychicness. So I teach people how to do, how to be able to do um, remote viewing, how to do telepathic communication, how to tell how close to death somebody is. I'm like a human MRI. I can scan somebody anywhere in the world and I can see broken bones, torn ligaments, stuff like that. Well, right at the beginning of the book, you, you go into this boy is communicating telepathically with his caregiver <laughs> and his best friend. And I'm going, okay, this is part of why I'm being led to read this book. Talk about that. Where did that come from? Well, you know, I, there, there's some debate. I think it can kind of be left to the reader a little bit, whether it's telepathy or whether it's just kind of an understanding of them. You know, I mean, he's been working with his caregivers for a very long time. His, he's with his best friend, Travis. They grew up together, you know, so that, so I think that like, Certainly, I, I, it's certainly not explicit that it's telepathy, but certainly the way that it communicates. The thing with Daniel is Daniel is unable to speak because he has his spinal muscular atrophy. Now, to be very clear, um, not everyone with spinal muscular atrophy cannot speak. Uh, Daniel cannot speak because spinal mus mus muscular atrophy affects everyone differently in a lot of different ways, which Daniel kind of explains in the book. Uh, but one of the things that he can't do is he can't speak. And so he has kind of developed this shorthand, if you want to call it, telepathy, if you'd like to call it, that you are more of an expert in the field than me. So I will let you use the uh, the, the terminology that you think is best. But certainly, uh, I think that the idea is uh, he is able to communicate wordlessly with people that know him very well and have been a, been a part of him a long time. And I think part of that is realistic. And part of it, frankly, is if you are writing a book from in the first person from a character who cannot speak, it's helpful to have ways for him to communicate with people. And I, and, and, and I kind of like the format, too, because it allows you, uh, uh, you know, so much of the book is internal. It's told entirely from Daniel's perspective that uh, it allows you to get a sense of not just how he communicates with with uh, the people that are closest to him, but what his relationship with them is like. And how they, how well they know each other, and how, and how there is an understanding that while he has this physical disability, he's certainly not treated differently, differently at all, or, or certainly thought of it as a differently by the people that are closest to him, which is something that obviously he is uh, very grateful for. Well, the telepathy thing, boy, I picked up on that in a heartbeat because I do that, and I teach people how to do it. And you communicate with anybody, whether it's a spirit that's in heaven or whether it's a spirit still attached to a body. And I communicate with people. There's a, a dear friend of ours. His mother is dying right now, and I communicate with her. She can't communicate with the family, but I'm giving the family information that she wants to convey, and that's what I teach people how to do. And I thought oh my goodness, is this something that can be and perhaps would be interesting to caregivers of people who can't communicate verbally? Because I know in the book, your Daniel's character has one of those deals where it's a computer and then it's an automated voice of what he wants to say because he can't talk. But I thought, would this be something that would be so beneficial to caregivers to teach them how to communicate telepathically? I mean, I certainly would have to, I, I would trust your judgment more on that than Mike, because you're more of an expert. But certainly, I think, uh, you know, I think one of the great things about uh, caregivers and one of the things that really inspired me to write the book along with, with uh, which I'm sure we'll get into, uh, my kind of personal experience with spinal muscular atrophy is uh, my mother was an ER nurse for 40 years. And so I have spent a lot of time in hospitals. I've spent a lot of time around caregivers and that kind of unique 
connection that caregivers have with the people that they help. Uh, on one hand, it is uh, as emotional and intimate as a relationship with two people can be uh, in a way that can be almost uncomfortable and almost uh, to, uh, there's an intimacy sometimes you'll have with the care caregiver that you may not have with your closest loved ones uh, in a lot of ways. But on the other hand, the caregiver, because they have to take care of a lot of people, has to be careful and has to not become too emotionally invested or they will be devastated every single day because they are constantly surrounded by sickness and illness. And so that dichotomy is something that I kind of knew from my mother and saw her for years and years and years working in the ER and, and how she had to kind of handle that every day. It's something I was really fascinated by. It's something I've spent a lot of time researching uh, in hospitals with caregivers, targeting caregivers, how they kind of balance that. Uh, and hopefully that comes across the relationship that Daniel has with Marjani. Marjani is the name of the woman who uh, takes care of him in the book. And hopefully that's a that's something that I, I think they can connect to. Oh, absolutely. And, and it was so well written and so beautifully written that it was just, I didn't, nobody would even think twice about it. It's just this guy's communicating with his caregiver and his best friend. Interestingly enough, I had a, a guy on recently who's a retired ER physician mm -hmm. and was director of a level one trauma center in Salt Lake City. And he came out of the closet after he retired and let everybody know that he could not only communicate with his patients telepathically, but also the spirits of their deceased loved ones. Like if somebody had died in a car accident and they, they were still alive, but their family members had died, their spirits would be in the ER. He could see them and he could communicate with them. His name's Jeff O'Driscoll. And so there are a lot of medical providers that do this, but they don't talk about it because a lot of them are either my students and graduates or their clients. And the stories I hear are just amazing. And I bet if you really quizzed your mom, she would give you some examples of things that she witnessed, you know, during well, her we're, time we're, in the emergency. I'll have you dinner tomorrow night. I'll get to I'll there get you to go. The center and see if I can get her to finally tell me. There you go. There you go. You also cover grief and um, in the book from a just a real visceral standpoint and and the ability again to the telepathic thing to be able to communicate with deceased loved ones. And I work with an organization called Helping Parents Heal, and it's global and it's like it sounds, it's people who've lost a child. And, uh, and the one thing that's the most comforting for them is to be able to communicate with that child telepathically. And the, the loved one who's in heaven, as I call it, is able to give them information that resonates with them. There's no way that the person who's helping them communicate would know. And there's university-based research now to corroborate all of this. And I, I'm on a, an advisory board at the University of Arizona for a, a, a professor named Gary Schwartz, Dr. Gary Schwartz, who was poached by Arizona from Yale. And they set up a whole department for him. And he says there's 99.9% statistical proof now that the spirit lives on past bodily death and he's working on an app and i thought you, you're going to be all over this it's called the soul phone yes. and it's going to be able to go on on cell phones and people are going to be able to communicate with their deceased loved ones from their cell phone and they've got uh, a multi uh, university research project going on right now that's corroborating everything that he's found in his research. So how cool is that? That's, that's Speaking cool. of tele telepathy, but I think that there's something there with caregivers to, to be able to educate them on that. Do you believe people are inherently good? I, I do. And I, and I, and I don't think that they're inherently perfect <laughs> to be very, very clear. Uh, but I, I think, in, I think Maybe not people are not inherently good. I think people inherently want to be good. And I think that's important. And I think it's important to be lost. One of the things that that Daniel talks about a lot in the book is the idea that, uh, you know, uh, he spends a lot of what Daniel's job in the book is that he runs a the, a complaint. He runs basically social media for a regional airline, which is another way of saying he gets yelled at by strangers all day. And so one of the things that Daniel kind of talks about is a he kind of likes being yelled at online because he doesn't get the fake niceness that he often gets because he has a severe disability. When people see him on a regular basis, he actually he kind of he kind of likes being called a jerk every once in a while, and people finally being kind of mean to him because they're usually kind of fake nice in real life. But what he's kind of noticed is that 
he sees kind of the ugliness of the online world, which I think we can all kind of understand, as a, as not a positive, but almost an outlet for people who are in pain. And an opportunity, and and, a, and he is empathetic to them. And one of the things he talks about is how, you know, no one ever goes. There are little moments of kindness that we all experience every single day that we don't even know. Whether it's something as small as you're walking into a supermarket and someone pauses to open someone that you will never see again, has no connection with you at all, and will never you'll never come across in your life. There, there's no po positive social benefit. They don't get a they don't get a coin or anything for holding the door for you. They do, but we just do it. We see this constantly all the time. These little moments of courtesy and kindness that are not big. They are not massive chair, things that you that today show would say, look at this new American hero and put you put you on. But there are these little quiet kindnesses that we have throughout all the day that we don't notice. Because what, what do we do? We notice the negative. We notice an upsetting thing. We notice something that uh, I always relate this to someone that's worked as a journalist for a long time that, you know, you never watch the evening news. And it, and the, the first story is, you know what? Everything's fine. Everything's OK. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. It's fine. Go back to what you were doing. Don't worry about it. We'll let you know if there's something really scary happening. If, if the aliens are attacking, we will definitely alert you. But otherwise, you're fine. Finish your dinner. Enjoy life with your family. Like, we don't do that because, because you know, at a certain level, uh, news is about change. News is about difference. News are, is about aberrations. And I think social media is actually very similar to that. I think you very rarely, I certainly don't see very often someone go on Facebook or whatever their social platform on and say, oh, someone held the door for me today. It was really nice. Like, we don't do that. We don't do that. We say, oh, someone slammed the door in my face. Why are people so mean? But the thing that I think Daniel is very understanding of, and I, I, I kind of learned from Daniel, if that makes a certain amount of sense, is that like, we, just because we see the negativity, we were pointing it out because it is an aberration. We point out the negativity, we point out the upsetting things because it's different than the normal level. The normal level is if normal life, every single moment were as painful as the moment that we post on social media, we would not be able to walk around the world. <laughs> and so Daniel is a lot of what Daniel talks about in the book is this ocean because he is an observer, because he is silent. He kind of sits and watches. He's able to see people at kind of their natural state. He sees this kindness. He sees this natural goodness that people want to do and inherently when they're not thinking do all the time we just don't note it that often because it feels normal we note the difference we note the change we note something that's scary or upsetting or or strange or bothers us but that's not actually what the norm is if it were different from the norm we would constantly be going on social media saying oh my gosh someone was nice today i can't believe it that never happens but it does happen. It happens all the time. And that is something that 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 to me is the key to Daniel's understanding of the world. And frankly, as someone who, you know, you always hear authors say things like, well, I just made the I just followed the character to wherever they were going to go. And before I wrote How Lucky, I will confess, I always found that a little like, yeah, that sounds a little pretentious, but I understand. I do kind of understand it now because Daniel, to me, is an aspirational figure. I wish I were more like Daniel. And, uh, and it's something I try to keep in mind when I'm navigating the world that uh, I'm particularly with all everyone has been through in the last few years, you're not seeing people at their best. We're still all kind of recovering. We're still all a little bit in, a, in either currently in trauma or a post-traumatic mode of one of the most tumultuous times I think any of us have ever lived through. Uh, I try, Daniel is very good about keeping that in mind about people. And uh, I try to do that myself as well. Well, what does the news say? If it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, <laughs> that, that kind of the, and, and for the record, know. they do not teach you that exact phrase in journalism school. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's implied. Though, it is right? implied. I, I agree. Implied. But, it, but they, they, they certainly don't for that. Exact. But yeah, but I think that's the thing. The, that's the key, though. I think that's a, that's a correct way to look at, but also maybe a little... It's that that I don't know if it's actually that cynical from your average journalist. I think it is more news is something that's different. News is change. News is something that is, and generally speaking, change from the normal is something bad, which I try to remind people, and Daniel tries to remind people, yes, but that means the normal is good. <laughs> that means the normal is good, and that's an okay place to be. Well, and I can tell you from a spiritual standpoint, we all come in to create. That's people say, well, what's my purpose in life? Well, you're here to create. Create what? Well, it's going to change minute by minute, hour by hour. And I always say, when you don't have any thoughts that feel badly, you're dead 
Because how do we create? We create out of the contrast. If everything was all hunky hunky all the time, we wouldn't have an incentive to create new things. And something's always being created. You think you get up in the morning, what do you do? You create brushing your teeth, you create what you're going to wear, you create what you're going to have for breakfast, you create what you're going to do that day. It can be as basic and as simple as that. So this is a good time for you to to go into how Daniel, the character, came into your head. What did you base it on? And, uh, you know, it sounds like Daniel kind of took on a life of his own inside your head as you were writing it. So I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, so just a little bit of background, just how the book itself kind of came and created. As I said, I'm I'm a journal. Uh, I'm probably more known. I would say I always joke that like uh, my my not my book editor has no idea that I write about sports. He doesn't care about sports. He doesn't know anything about sports at all. And then there's a whole other life where I write about sports for New York Magazine and all of these places all the time that have nothing to do with fiction at all. So I always kind of like having these parallel. It's like a secret life. And so I had worked for a very long. I'd written four books, but uh, one was a uh, young adult novel about. 15, almost 20 years ago now. The other ones were all sports books. They were all kind of connected to a lot of my sports writing. And they were fun. I enjoyed doing them. But, I, but then I kind of took a break from writing for a while. I got married. I had a, I, I don't know if you, if any, you or any of your viewers have had this experience, but uh, sometimes when like uh, your, your family has a child, it dramatically changes everything. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that at all. <laughs> but so certainly it slowed me down writing books for a long time. And so I just kind of was really focused on that. We moved from New York City to Georgia. And um, so I hadn't really thought, I kind of wanted to write a novel, but I hadn't really sure what I was going to do. And then my son, uh, one of my wife's oldest friends, she is from Columbus, Georgia. One of her oldest friends, uh, she and her wife uh, uh, had a donor had a donor to have a baby. And their baby was born around the same time as our son, William. Their son's name was Miller. Uh, and so we were very excited, obviously, because my Eason, my, my wife's friend and her, grew up together. They'd known each other since they were two years old. So we were so excited to have that kind of opportunity for our son to have two sons around the same age. Do the same thing. So we spent all this time together. They would come to Athens for Georgia football games, and um, basically, um, in a scene that's created, direct, uh, recreated directly in the book. Uh, one day, they were just kind of crawling around. But they're about a year old, a little older, um, crawling around. And uh, my son William was able to like put lay, uh, put weight on his legs and kind of move around. And Miller, uh, Eason's son, was unable to. And so they kind of checked it out and they discovered that he had spinal muscular atrophy. Now, for any uh, viewers that don't necessarily know what spinal muscular atrophy is, uh, a quick and dirty way to look at it. This is not 100% accurate. It's not a one-to-one -one ratio, but it's an easy way to understand it. It's a little bit like ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, but for children. It's a terrible, terrible disease. It's a progressive disease. It's a, it's a muscular atrophy, you know, so it's a progressive disease. And in many ways, uh, there's been a lot of good medical advances in the last few years, but a lot of people that were born, you know, 20 years ago likely did not make it. Or uh, like, it's a very difficult disease. And so it was obviously a devastating thing for Eason and her and her wife, and really for us, obviously, uh, to learn. And so they, but you know, Eason and Lindsay, uh, her wife, were very, very aggressive of being like, "We're going to fight this. We're going to do everything we can." So they started a, a race every year called the Go Miller Go 5K. So we, they live in Charleston, South Carolina. So we would always go to Charleston. We'd always do this race, and I spent a lot of time not just with Miller and his family, but a lot of other families of people, but with people with SMA and families of people with SMA. And I could not help but notice <laughs> that a bunch of people, able-bodied people like me, would be there. And even though SMA does not affect your mind and does not affect your mind in any way, shape, or form, it only affects your your your, your physical exterior body. Because the the disability is so power so overwhelming visually for a lot of people, they would speak to the people with people with SMA as if there was something mentally wrong with them or as if they were children. And I kind of got kind of obsessed with that idea of communication. So I would talk to people with SMA. I was like, so does that annoying? And they're like, oh, do not get me started. <laughs> and so I was like, no, I'd like to get you started. And so I spent a lot of time talking to people with SMA, talking to families with SMA. And I really wasn't necessarily thinking of writing a book yet. I really was just personally fascinated. And then I kind of started thinking about how it did seem, this was written mostly 2018 and 2019, it felt like um, a large part of our country was not talking to each other in many ways was talking past each other. And the community, I wanted to write something about communication and the difficulty of communicating. And then that kind of wrapped up in, in what I was talking to all these people with SMA and that became Daniel. <laughs> and so Daniel, Daniel, uh, he's 26 years old. So, in, you know, in a lot of ways he is toward 
I wouldn't say the end of his life, but certainly uh, his mortality is something he has to be very aware of on a regular basis. And it's given him a lot of perspective to what you were talking about with grief and, and that sort of thing. So basically, I, I had Daniel. I actually figured out Daniel and wrote a bunch of stuff. I did not tell my agent I was writing the book at all. <laughs> I just kind of wrote it on my own because I did not want to have it be, I felt like if I told my agent and tried to sell it before I wrote it, it would turn the book in a direction that I didn't want it to go. I wasn't really interested in having it be a traditional thriller that hits this act and this act and this act. I wanted Daniel to kind of have his, I wanted to figure out Daniel's story before I tried to sell it because I thought that would change it. And so I just wrote it without telling him <laughs> I wrote the whole book and then I uh, sent it to my agent. And uh, I said, I don't care what you do with this. If you can just get an ISBN number, get it on Amazon for crying out loud. I don't care. And he said, I love it. I, th I think we can do something with it. So I was very fortunate to have uh, people that embrace the book. Uh, but what my, the main thing for me was he because Daniel witnesses a crime, but I don't actually consider the book, and you may disagree, and readers may disagree. I don't actually consider the book a thriller. Certainly, there is a thriller aspect to it. There are thrilling moments. I don't necessarily, he's trying to find out uh, who abducted this woman, uh, but I don't know if it, I don't consider it a mystery either, though. I guess to me, all books where I don't know what happens, it's a mystery. <laughs> That's kind of the fun of a book like that. So, uh, but for me, a lot of it was just kind of do right by not only Daniel, but so many people in the SMA community who donated their time to me and uh, let me know all the things that I was getting wrong. And there was plenty uh, uh, that uh, really helped make Daniel's story kind of come to life. So it was inspiring. It was great to be able to do. I've been very honored that Cure SMA, the primary SMA uh, charity, has embraced the book and promoted the book. I've been very fortunate that they've done that. And I'm very honored. And hopefully we've been able to do some good. But uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it's, been, it's been a very touching experience to, to be able to even meet more and more people and, and learn more from their experience. Interestingly enough, I have a business partner that died from ALS. Oh, okay. And he was my friend for 30 years, very close friend and Sorry. business partner. And so a lot of what you go through with Daniel, mm -hmm. I I didn't witness it. He lived in Los Angeles, but I certainly talked to him all the time and he would be able to tell me what was going on. And I could scan him energetically and do energetic healings on him and, you know, all of that. But some of the different characteristics that you talk about, boy, really resonated with me because of my, my late partner, Tom. And I think that was one of the the really profound things that you did when you were weaving this story together and and certainly the mystery parts in there and i loved the college football thing because the <laughs> georgia coach kirby smart we sent from alabama uh, yes, and yes. everybody loves kirby still he, here he is in fact he is in fact a a uh, college friend of my wife. One of my favorite stories about this is uh, when I met my wife in New York City, uh, she she knew I wrote about wrote about sports. And uh, she said, hey, so you write about, she's not a big sports fan. So you write about sports. So a friend of mine is like a coach somewhere. I'm not sure where. He's like maybe Auburn or Florida. I'm like, well, what's his name? She's like, Kirby Smart or Curbs. As I know, I'm like, oh, you mean the defensive coordinator in Alabama? Yes, I do know. I do know. For 10 is. years. Yes. And so like, it's so funny now that like I live in Athens and our kids are friends and like all of these. It's very funny how the world kind of ends up in that funny place. Well, and he's such a great guy and, and all the Alabama fans still love him. And, you know, if somebody has got to win the national championship besides <laughs> the Ohio State University, uh, Kirby, I'm all for it. That's I good. I, I, I'm assuming you speak for all Alabama fans, too, when you say that. Uh, probably not. No, probably but not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but I want to come to a Georgia game. I haven't been to a oh. Georgia game yet. So can you help facilitate that? I'll come oh. go with you. It would I would love honor. that. It would be really funny. You know, and, and it's funny because, you know, the book does have take place. Um, I originally knew that How Lucky was going to take place over a one week span. This way, I kind of arced out the story. It would take place in one week. And I felt like, well, if I'm going to have the book be in Athens, I kind of got to have it be a game week. And so it becomes yeah. a fun way. And also, I would say one thing that I think thematically that I think college football kind of lends to the book. One of the things I love about Athens, I love about football and really sports in general. Because uh, the book is very, very not about sports. Like there is a college football element, but it's certainly, it's a background. The book is not a sports book. But certainly the thing, I, one of the things I love about sports, it really brings together so many different types of people. Uh, you know, uh, the, the joke I always say about this is, it's not even a joke, it's something I experienced. You know, we just had a very contentious election here in Georgia. And I really enjoyed that there was a tailgate with an Abrams sign out front and a tailgate with a Kemp sign out front. And they were all still 
uh, cheering and go cheering the dogs on. And I think in a world where sometimes it's kind of difficult to find things uh, again, kind of talking past each other or, or that we are somewhat polarized. I feel like sports is a way that I think can help bring people together in that way. And it's certainly something that Daniel, who likes sports less than I do, <laughs> but uh, certainly likes sports. I think he kind of witnesses and sees is that it? It is a. It's so hard to find those kind of unifying things. He likes the sports, but what he really likes is that it brings everyone together in a way that so few things do. And that's what the research shows, because my son's in the sports mm -hmm. business, and the research shows that it's not necessarily about the teams and the players; it's about the fans yeah. and what the fans can do together, and how it's a common denominator in their lives, and it gives them the opportunity to share that part of their lives when maybe other parts don't really mesh. So point well taken. One of the profound things I think in the book too is how you bring, how, you talked about it earlier about how you bring to light how people with disabilities are treated and the semantics that you point out, I thought, I thought were really well taken and from my viewpoint anyways. And one that I really resonated with me well was when you said, People who are in wheelchairs, they use wheelchairs. They're not in wheelchairs. And you point out that the semantics of how can we change that so that the people who are using the wheelchairs aren't feeling like they're marginalized in the in the meantime with yeah. our with our words and we're not even aware we're doing it. Yeah, and to be honest, I was not really aware of a lot of this stuff either. Because I, you know, what? Uh, listen, I'm an, I, I am certainly recognizing that I am an able-bodied person writing from the perspective of someone that has a disability, and so that requires uh, um, a lot of work. To be entirely honest, to get it right, you know, I want to do those stories right. And frankly, that is there's a lot of things, so many things of Daniel's day-to-day -day life and his viewpoint and, and and his view on that comes directly from conversations with people with SMA and people that, and also with people other with other disabilities. So Ebel Palsy, I think, would be another good example of of that. And that is, you know, it's funny. Um what um I I worked with the Cure SMA charity and I there's someone on their board that I spoke with after the book had come out. And she said she told me she loved the book. And she said, I have to tell you, uh, every single time I ever read a book or watch a movie about a dis someone with a disability, I spend most of the time being like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna screw this up. Let me just wait for the moment where they screw it up and it completely takes me out of the narrative. And that didn't happen in your book. How did that happen? And I said, because I showed it to a bunch of people like you before it was published and they let me know the stuff that I got wrong. And oh, did they? And to me, that is good. And you know, it's strange. I know there's a certain viewpoint now of like some people should be able to write about some things and some people shouldn't be able to write other things. To me, the important thing is getting it right. Uh, and and uh, and honoring the people that you're writing about by telling their story correctly. And that is the journalism part. That to me, a large one of the most fun parts of writing the book was talking to so many people like, affected by SMA and in the SMA community who just let me know, like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> this is what it is. And that I'm so grateful for that. And I think there are people that are weirdly defensive sometimes when they hear uh, when they hear, oh, well, that's not correct. That's not the way that we would do that. That I embrace that and welcome that. I want to get it right too. And in the same way that you know, if uh, uh, I, my mom, I talked about my mother being an ER nurse. Anytime she ever watches a TV show that's set in a hospital, she is always on alert <laughs> for the things that are not right. And so she's like, oh, that would never happen. They never do that. And I appreciate that as someone that's creating a world that I want to get those details right. I want the people that are the closest to the narrative whether it's someone with an SMA or someone in the next book, which actually takes place a lot in a hospital, people that work in a hospital, I don't want them to be taken out of it. I want them to feel like this is a, rec a place that they recognize. And frankly, the more and more you talk to them, you get more details like that. To be entirely honest, I did not know that the terminology before, when, when I when my first draft of the book, it is in a wheelchair. <laughs> like it is, it is in a wheelchair. And then you just talk to enough people like, no, it's not in a wheelchair, you use a wheelchair. And I was like, of course, of course, yes. Like that's what I, that, that to me, that's what you want. And I think that like, it's not meant to be, uh, I know some people have, have read that certain part and be like, well, I didn't know, don't get mad at me. It's not a hectoring. It's not, a, it is, it is not a hectoring. It is not, you are doing something wrong. It's not that I couldn't have known. I'm not, I don't have a disability. I, I had not thought of it that way. To me, that's the point of doing anything, whether it's uh, reading a book 
or, or, or talking to someone or having a new experience, learning something you didn't know already and being able to convey that, that to me is the point of anything. It's having the kind of a natural curiosity for the world. So uh, yeah, th there are a lot of the things that people have said they've learned from how lucky uh, I really can't take a lot of credit for it because I learned it from other people uh, asking them before. Because uh, again, that's the journalism part. I can't write a story for 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 a magazine or a newspaper and just get a bunch of details wrong and say, "Oh no, it's part of my artistic vision." Like, no, you have to you have to get the details right, and I feel that kind of obligation and and really that desire to uh, to do right by the people who have helped me so much. Well, you gave them a voice. And I believe that that journalistic integrity that you have led you to the place where you wrote it. And then you were led to check it out with these people and you gave them a voice that they didn't have. And I found several things in there very educational for me. And I will change when I interact with somebody that has a disability. I will change how I converse with them based on what I learned from this profound book. So Thank you for educating me and educating those that read your book. Back to my partner, Tom. He was a Corvette guy uh -huh. and had Corvettes and had like classic Corvettes. Mm -hmm. When I'd ride with him in his 65 Corvette, I, all I could think of was the people next to us. You know, we'd have the top down and stuff and the people next to us going, get your muffler fixed from that old. <laughs> no, it that's was a, that's so a feature, loud. not a bug. <laughs> so loud. But he wasn't able to drive, certainly as the ALS progressed. But he, but when he got some new souped up wheelchair, he had his wife videotape him and he sent it to me and he was going really fast. They had a circular <laughs> driveway and there was a fountain in the middle. Oh my gosh. I think he was, he was like doing wheelies and on two wheels when he was turning corners. It was a riot. So it gave him. It, he said it It felt like it gave him part of his life back yeah. because he was a speed demon <laughs> and he couldn't do it in his cars with him driving anymore. But he, he could, I mean, I don't know how fast those things go. He said it went up to 20 miles an hour, if not, <laughs> if not faster. I don't know if that's true. But anyways, yeah. I related to that when I, when I read that in the book. You also addressed the topic of mortality and someone feeling lucky to be living on borrowed time did that have an impact on you and how you how you live your life how do you separate your work life and your personal life did did that that narration in your head about daniel and knowing that he's living on borrowed time did that affect how you see things in your own personal life uh, it's something I aspire to, like a lot of things with Daniel, but don't always succeed at. Uh, you know, certainly I would love to say that uh, every moment where I'm stuck in traffic, uh, I'm like, well, I should just be appreciative to have this moment. But it doesn't always feel that way, I would say. But you do your best, right? You know, one of the things with Daniel that I really like, he's 26 years old. But, you know, in in the real world, he is, I mean, in the world of SMA, he's actually quite old. <laughs> if anything, you know, he talks about people that he knows that have made it to 40, but that's about it. And again, to be clear, there, uh, there's been a drug called Spinraza uh, that has been, it made a huge difference for many people in the SMA community. It's extended life. It's uh, slowed the progression of the disease. For Miller, my son's friend, it's been a godsend for Miller. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, that's something that Daniel being older would not really have necessarily had access to as young, but certainly still there is a compressed line frame time frame uh, 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 and, and lifespan that I think Daniel is very vividly aware of. And one of the things, you know, uh, one of the main characters we haven't talked about in the book is Travis, his best friend. And I think what's kind of interesting about Travis is, you know, Travis is also 26 years old, but he is not at the end of his life at all. He is actually still actually quite unformed and really doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. Is just kind of idling. He's in that space. I think a lot of people are when they're in their mid twenties and they're maybe they're not married or they, and they're still like, they haven't figured out exactly what they want to do with their lives, but they're getting, starting to maybe get a little bit older. And I thought it was really interesting to, con to, to contrast basically uh, what 26 year old needs for Travis and what it means for Daniel. And I think it's given Daniel some hard earned wisdom uh, about uh, not only appreciating life, uh, but understanding how finite it is. And, you know, Daniel talks in the book about how 
listen, I, I, I feel fine today. I don't, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't think today is the day, but it could happen. It could happen out of nowhere. You know, it could happen because of, uh, 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 he, uh, you know, one of the things that Daniel can't do is he can't cough because one of the things that, so he has to have like a, a cough assist machine with him at all times. If the machine's too far away, if he falls over and, and bust and, and bust something, I think, uh, 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 a lot of times like, you know, infections and viruses are incredibly dangerous for someone with SMA, and you, and, you, and you never know when one of those is going to come up. So it's made him be aware that, yes, I feel fine now, and I think I'm okay, but this could happen tomorrow, and I can't do anything about it. And we all talk about that, right? And if we do not have a disability like this, or if we feel like we're living a quote-unquote normal uh, life, we don't think about the fact that a piano could fall on our head tomorrow. But it could. <laughs> but it could. And so I think that, like... Uh, Daniel, I think, tries to remain very vividly uh, present and alert and aware in his life, uh, not as like a signpost for people that are not with SMA, but just something in his life that I think is he feels like he wants to embrace all of these moments because he doesn't he has to live, be vividly aware that it could all be taken away in any minute. And and I think that's an interesting contrast with someone like Travis, who, again, is is the exact same age, but in an entirely different life uh, situation. But I think it helps Travis, too. And I think it helps a lot of the people around Daniel right? in, a, in a way that's hopefully interesting and, and helping. You know, you talked a little bit, a bit about grief. And uh, and I do think that, like, you know, there is grief is definitely a uh, there's a, a it runs throughout the book i don't think there's any question about that and but it's hope it's hopefully a warm grief like you know like the idea that like th to have you know you you've experienced loss i've experienced loss we've all experienced loss and the, it's obviously devastating and i think of people that i care about now and losing them it makes me want to jump out a window and hide under the couch it's terrible but when i think about people that i have cared about that i have lost i do not I do not walk around the world being angry and crying that they're gone. That's not how my grief is. That's not how grief, I think, manifests itself ultimately for most people. It ultimately lands in, oh, now I can just appreciate the good things. Now, I, now like when I think of when I think of my uncle who died uh, a few years ago, I don't think about how he died or how I don't get to see him anymore. I'm sad. I'm aware of those things. But what I think about is that time we went to the Illini basketball game and that time that he came to my wedding and we had a toast afterwards. And those are the things that I think of. And I think that is what grief is. And one of the things that Daniel talks about is that idea of, you know, I'm going to be gone. I don't know when I'm going to be gone, but I will be gone. And so will you, by the way. And so will all the rest of you, by the way. And so how are you going to be thought of when you're gone? How will you, what will be the things that you remember? What, what parts of life did you embrace rather than reject out of fear. And I think that's something that, that uh, and you know, one of the things that Daniel talks about in the book is he actually, one of the reasons, this is not the exact uh, uh, reason for the title, but one of the reasons that he does feel lucky is he actually feels fortunate that he gets to leave first. He feels like he will never have to grieve his mother. He'll never have to grieve Travis. He'll never have to grieve Marjani. He'll never have to grieve, he'll never have to, you know, he'll, there's a lot of, all there's a whole sorts of sadness in the world that he won't have to face. And that makes him feel Kind of force it almost makes him feel a little guilty that he would put uh, that his friend that his, the people that love him will mourn him and he will not have to mourn them. Uh, it is uh, I feel like it's an interesting way to think about it is the idea that when you are uh, in, in a way it's almost a gift to go before <laughs> uh, a lot of people to not have to deal with that grief and so that's something that he wrestles with a lot. And I think it's something a lot of people wrestle. With. That was a really interesting point. When I read that, I thought, whoa, this. You are really on to something with that. I never thought about it that way before, but you really hit on something with that. The sports world can be so cynical, you know, again, if it bleeds, it leads. But the sports world's all about, well, this guy's, you know, not on his game right now and things like that. So how do you switch gears or do you and write about kindness, compassion and altruistic slash spiritual values when you're working on a book like How Lucky and and some of your other novels, is there something that does it just come naturally? Do you write something and then you go back and read it later and you go, I don't really remember writing that? But this is pretty good. <laughs> that, certainly that certainly yeah. happened. That certainly happened. Does it happen as much with articles as it does with novels? Uh, well, it's funny. At a certain level, a novel, specifically How Lucky, like now, I, it's hard to remember writing it. <laughs> if I'm being entirely honest, because I'm so in Daniel's headspace 
that like there are things that I'll read and I'll be like, hey, that's pretty good. I wonder. Oh, oh wow! That was, like it, 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 it's it's uh, uh, there was a comedian that once said that uh, every time that he uh, uh, says something funny, he laughs because it's the first time he's heard it. <laughs> and I feel like there is something to that. Uh, you know, it's been so long. Like there are sent- there are paragraphs in How Lucky that has now been six years since I wrote. That's a long time. To, to to remember i and listen there uh, other writers have much better understanding than that my my I always joke that my agent uh my agent has is also john grisham's agent which sounds more impressive than it is it's definitely cool he's john grisham's agent it's less cool that he's mine <laughs> but anyway the bo- the cool one is john grisham's been writing books for 30 35 years I wonder if he sits down and reads a line from the Pelican Brief and feels like vividly attached to it, or if it feels like something that happened so long ago. So that's a different sort of thing. But when it comes to sports, I'm actually not very cynical about sports, which uh, I would argue puts me uh, at odds (laughs) with probably most sports writers and hopefully actually contributes uh, to the things I'm able to do well. Now, I think that sometimes not being cynical, uh, uh, people confuse it with somehow being naive or being like unaware of uh, some of the unpleasantries around sports or around the world or so on. I think that uh, you can be very aware of the negative things that are going on in sports or in the world or anything else and not feel, um, what's the old line that they say at, 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 at the end of uh, investment reports? Uh, past performance is no indicator of future results. Uh, just because things have bad happened before does not mean something bad is about to happen in the same way that just because good things are happening before doesn't mean something good is about to happen as well. Life is unpredictable and life is weird things at all. And so for me as a sports writer and really as a, even with with my novel, not just how lucky, but uh, but the time has come, uh, you want to be open and curious about the world and be open for the things that the world has to offer you. And, you know, I think that um, I... You know, when I first started writing about sports, I met a lot of people that have been writing about sports for a long time. I would see them in the press box and they'd be like, oh, this game's never going to get over. I'm saying the food up here is cold. And I, to me, I'm like, come on, dear, you're at a game. You're here for free. You get to talk to the players. Why are you not enjoying this? And listen, I understand it's difficult. It, it becomes a job, right? It becomes a job to do that every day. And I understand that. So I kind of tried to, pa- I've tried to pattern my sports writing career to where it doesn't feel that way. I, I, I've always said that if I, uh, if I go into a sporting event being like, oh, I just want this to get over, so I can like I then I've lost I've lost what not only have I lost something of myself, I've lost the ability to connect to the reader because the reader is not feeling that way. And so I think a lot of the worst kinds of not just sports journalism but real journalism come from that like kind of fake jaded oh we've seen it all before and i'm wise to this stuff because a that i don't believe the person when they're saying that but also that's not how the average person reacts to the world at all the average person is constantly surprised and curious about these things because they don't live with it the way that everybody else does so i try to keep that in mind when i'm running about sports it helps that i'm not in the press box for every game and i don't have to go in the locker room all the time i'm able to write about things from kind of a twenty-five thousand foot up perspective that helps uh but certainly um I think a lot of it's attitude. You just have to, you have to want to enjoy this stuff. People go into sports writing because they love sports. I feel, or sport, not sports writing or anything in sports. Your son working in sports. I'm sure he did not, I'm sure he did not hate sports, but stumbled into the world of sports. He likes sports. He wanted to be involved in sports. He's probably liked sports for a really, really long time. To me, it's tr- uh, uh, tragic is probably too ha- strong of a word, but it's certainly very sad when someone uh, grows up loving sports and, can- and wants to be close to the world of sports and wants to write about sports, and then they get into covering sports, their dream job that they always wanted to do, and they don't like sports anymore because of it. There's something very sad about that. And so uh, for me, I- I've tried to pattern my career to where I'm not cynical about it. I'm aware. I write about the problems in sports all the time. But I won't let them stop me from the reason that I start, started caring about sports. Well, and you, it, you obviously were led to do that. And and the other thing is when you're writing your novels, you're channeling. I hate to go woo-woo on you, but no, I don't really hate it. You are. Every author channels, every composer, every screenwriter, everybody's channeling all of that. And I think it's fun how you're so diversified and um, from Deadspin to GQ to movie reviews and lots of podcasts in between. I'm like, gosh, you're so multifaceted. Faceted. So how do you keep it all straight? And what makes you say yes to different projects as they arrive? Uh, I say yes to everything. This is like, this is my rule. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I don't know 
and I think this is probably true for most people, I don't know what I'm good or bad at until I do it. And I don't want to live in fear. of I have failed so much. I'm going to fail. I probably failed several times in this call. I will fail after we are done. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, like all humans, am just a series of failures. And there are occasional good moments in there. And there are things I did that works. But I'm not afraid of failure. It's going to happen. I can't do anything about it. I can try to learn from my failures and try to improve and do better. But the, the notion of being afraid of not being good at something and therefore not doing it strikes me as very silly. Uh, I would rather fail at something than not do it and never know. And uh, so that has led to, because I always knew I wanted to write, but you know, I, I've done a lot of television. I briefly hosted a TV show for Sports Illustrated that was watched by so many people that they don't do the show anymore. <laughs> but, uh, but it was fun. You know, it was a fun thing to say yes to and try out and see if I could do. And the same goes for movie reviews. The same goes for writing long investigative journalism piece and then to, to writing novels. You know, I, I'm from a small town in rural Illinois, where I, I always say I'm from a I'm from a long I'm I'm, I'm from a, a long line of non-readers. <laughs> and so, like I'm my family. Like, I I always joke about this, but my, I have an uh, my my I have an aunt in back in Mattoon who lo loves me and wants to support my career, but just doesn't read. She just doesn't read. She's just not into it. And so, uh, so I was like, well, maybe you can try an audio. Maybe you can listen to an audiobook. So I got her the audiobook and she got like like five minutes in. She's like, wait, this isn't Will. Why would I listen to this? Someone else is reading Will's book. Like someone had like snuck in and taken it. And so like I say this is to say that like I'm it's remarkable to me that I get to do any of this. Like it, uh, I, my, my father's electrician and my mother is a nurse. There are no writers in my family. This is not something I just, for whatever reason, struck by the lightning bolt. It's something I wanted to do from a very young age. And uh, I feel kind of blessed and fortunate to be able to do this at all. So the idea that I'm going to come this far uh, uh, to be able to do this for my living and my calling and my art and say, Oh, I don't know. That's too scary. I shouldn't try. By the time that I would never got out of Matsu in the first place. And so for me, you know, I like to uh, uh, I like to say yes to things. I and listen, it requires a lot of organization. Uh, certainly the kids sports schedules are always <laughs> very locked in. We always work around them uh, on everything. Uh, uh, and for me, work completing the work is actually not the hard part. It's really making sure that I'm present for everyone else in my life. Uh, you know, that that is. Uh, and and that's something that, frankly, is easier in Athens, Georgia, than it was in New York City. And not, I love living in New York. I lived in New York for 13 years. I've been Athens, in Athens for almost 10 years now. And it's it's you know I, mean, it's, you, I don't need to tell you it's easier. Yeah, you get to, you have more time to be able to do all of the things you want to do. And you know it's cheaper. I'm not gonna lie about that. It's warmer. The weather's better, and people are generally in better moods. And so I you know I think that's helped too. Is making decisions that will allow me to do all the things I want to do and try out all the things I want to do and say yes to new opportunities without feeling that I'm losing the thing that's actually the most important to me, uh, which, is, which is my family and the people uh, people that live in this beautiful house that my wife, who's an interior decorator, has designed. So uh, though she 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 has a bunch of pillows that are beautiful that are behind me that are usually here, but I move them out of the way for the Zoom uh, to get that. But uh, uh, yeah, that, that to me, the challenge is not getting it done. I'm very organized. I'm very, I have a to-do list I do every day and I literally mark it off on a steno pad every day to get everything done. I have a very organized calendar. It's the only way to do it. Not so much to get all the work done, but to make sure I still have time for everything else that's important in my life. Well, I think there's a much bigger picture here with you and with everyone in that you've been led to do this because you're so, as I mentioned, masterful at what you write and how you write that you are benefiting everybody that reads your stuff and everybody that shares your stuff with others. So for you to come from a background of non-writers and to have had the success that you have just from reading the How Lucky book, my goodness, <laughs> I, it, it just is so illuminating in so many ways and entertaining at the same time that I there's not a doubt in my mind that you're being led to do this and it's going to be fun to watch your career going forward and see where you go next with all of this and and I appreciate that you're like a plate spinner 
that they used to have on the Ed Sullivan show. Yeah, I'm yeah. dating myself. Well, you it know, feels, guy, it certainly feels he, that way. It certainly he'd be spinning a plane and then he <laughs> put another one and then he'd go back and he'd spin the first one a little bit more. And, you know, and you got all these plates spinning on the same way. Yeah. I, um, like, listen, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm alive. You know, I want to do things. You know, right. I mean, it, it, it seems, it seems strange to, uh, uh, all the circumstances and all the things that had to come together for me to be living at this exact moment and be able to be around the people and be able to do the things I get to do. I'm not going to spend it binging Netflix. <laughs> I'm going to go do stuff. And the thing right. wrong with binging Netflix, Beef is a really good show, by the way, if you get a chance. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I want to do things. You know, I, I don't know. I Like Daniel, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. <laughs> so right. like, you know, I, I want to be able to say yes to stuff. It's exciting for me. Yeah, there's a lot of plates to spin sometimes, but uh, you know, the, the spinning plates is kind of fun too. Yeah. Well, I, I have a communications degree and I'm an inventor of surgical devices sold throughout the world. And I founded nine companies in five industries. And people say, well, how's that work? Like you, something I was interested in. I said, yes, I took a step and then, you know, it all materialized from there. So I, I believe that, that I am a colossal plate spinner like you are. Seems like you've always been a writer first throughout your career. And in terms of the increasing AI and chat GPT, et cetera, what concerns you about that if it does and how can writers use it to their advantage without being made obsolete? Um, explain what it is to everybody first. Yeah, so and artific- explain- AI and artificial intelligence, yeah, it, it is a lot of ways that like there's, there's now these chat bots that can like, I, I would say impersonate human behavior rather than necessarily uh uh, some say it's a simulation. I think they're probably using external clue, cues to impersonate. But it's a way, you know, uh, you're seeing it integrated into chat a lot. You're seeing this, you're going to start seeing it integrated into search uh, very soon. I think Bing is already doing that. And the idea is it will automate, theoretically speaking, if you wanted to. I think I have done this to experiment. I actually had um, uh, the AI chatbot write me uh, an introductory press conference for my uh, getting hired to be the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. Now, that has not happened for, for the record, but someday I'm still hoping I'll say yes to it if I get the opportunity. Uh, but certainly, uh, and it will produce that for you in a matter of seconds. And so uh, I would say certainly on one hand, AI will keep getting better because it's pretty glitchy right now. But uh, and it definitely is really bad about getting facts correct. It certainly that's, it's very, it struggles with that a lot. However, you know, I do think it will get better. I will say that um, I find it encouraging as a writer because... Um, AI can impersonate humans. AI cannot actually be human. And, and, and AI can mirror what it believes or what it, the data that it gets from a human being doing human things. It can't actually feel those things. And I'm sorry, when I'm writing, and like my, my favorite kind of writing is all about feeling things and all about those recognizable emotions. Uh, a computer can p- personate emotions. It cannot have emotions. And so because of that, I think uh, it will be very helpful for uh, public relations companies to write press releases uh, because they have a very clear format and they have very clear buzzwords that they use to do certain things. That If, if that's your job, uh, uh, you're going to have to get better. <laughs> that you're in danger. I think there's a danger for that. Actual writing, writing, um, I, if you are are touching on emotional themes in the human experience, uh, if a uh, I, I'm not, I, I think I can beat a computer at that. <laughs> I don't think I can beat them at at the press releases, but I think I can beat them at that. And I think most people can. And to me, you know, it speaks to what I love about writing. Uh, the, whether I'm doing it or my favorite writers, the things that they do, it is sincere and real and emotional and human uh, in a way that is specific. And kind of not something you can really replicate, and so that's exciting for me. Is uh, uh, I, I'm curious to see how it, how it turns out, uh, but uh, on the whole, I I do think some of the doomsaying notions about this um, are, are probably a little bit overstated. Uh, for what it's worth, if it uh, if it turns out that I it's a, I'm able to say that because if it turns out that I'm wrong, you know what can I do? But, no, no one's gonna, there's, unless the unless the AI bots all put together a highlight reel of dum dums like me getting predictions wrong just to mock us before they use our bodies for food, um, I will be a part of that highlight reel. But it won't matter at that point. So uh, I think I do think this gets a little over. I think it will help. It will help automate very low level tasks. 
uh, in a way that I think will be valuable and I think could be positive. I think probably will be positive uh, to not just uh, uh, people, uh, workers, but I think humanity as a whole. I think there is a lot of positivity. But the idea that it's that uh, someone's going to be able to really uh, uh, love a AI written novel, I'll believe it when I see it. Interesting. Last question. Your new book, The Time Has Come, mm -hmm. which is behind you, is coming out in May of 2023, coming out here in a matter of weeks. When people go out and get it, what can they expect from it? The the it, the book is, in, I, I, I will be careful of plot details. I will just simply say this. Uh, it is very much of a piece of how lucky and that what it really is, is about empathy and making the best of difficult situations and understanding that the people that you meet have things going on in their lives too. And uh, it's about, you know, uh, the, the book starts with a uh, uh, quote from the great writer Raymond Chandler, uh, who talks about um, uh, dealing with difficult times and how you recover from them and how uh, recognizing that ev what everyone's going through, um, you can't know it, but you need to be gentle and empathetic to it. And the book is about uh, seven characters. Uh, there are seven characters. You follow them. Uh, it's made very clear at the beginning of the day something big is going to happen. At the beginning of the book, something big is going to happen at the end of the day at this very specific place. And then you follow seven people throughout their day as you get to know them and learn about their lives. And then they end up at that place where the dramatic thing happens, I would say. And you see how they react to it, how they interact with one another, and how uh, um, all the different spreads of uh, all the different strains of uh, humanity kind of come together and hopefully, in a way, help people. So uh, I, I, one of the problems, I wouldn't say a problem with the book, one of the things we've been talking about with the book is it's very hard to discuss, like, with how lucky you're like, man with a disability witnesses a crime and tries to report it. Boom, there you go. You know what it's about. Here, it's hard to describe it without saying too much of what the book is about. So just trust me, if you liked How Lucky, you will definitely like the title. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. I think you're really extraordinary. I think that the work that you're doing is really just amazing. And thank you for everything that you're doing for the masses and all of the different niches that you play in. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Everybody's sending you lots of love from Sweet Home, Alabama, <laughs> and from Athens, Georgia too, go dogs. Yeah. So I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow Julie on Instagram and YouTube at Ask Julie Ryan and like her on Facebook at Ask Julie Ryan. To schedule an appointment or submit a question, please visit AskJulieRyan.com. This show is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be medical, psychological, financial, or legal advice. Please contact a licensed professional. The Ask Julie Ryan Show, Julie Ryan and all parties involved in producing, recording, and distributing it assume no responsibility for listeners' actions based on any information heard on this or any Ask Julie Ryan shows or podcasts.